So in the last class, we started the introduction to uh, criminal law, kind of conceptualizing what criminal law is. And then we started walking through the elements of criminal law. All right. So All right, so what we did is we began by looking at actus reus, right? The criminal act, the actual action itself. Remember, omissions are acts as well, if there's a legal duty of two acts. All right, so it's the physical action. Some action has to occur in order for a crime to occur. All right now, no matter how big or small the action is, it's an action nonetheless. Right? So this is how people get charged with attempted crimes, right? Because they've done something, they maybe had a conversation about a, committing a crime. Having a conversation about committing a crime is a conspiracy and an attempted crime. Right? So I depend on the jurisdiction. But that's an act, right? Just a simple conversation constitutes an act. You always have to have an act. Then you have to have the mens rea, right? The mens rea is the guilty mindset. Um, remember, we talked about specific intent and general intent. And then we talked about mens rea, the four levels of mens rea, right? In order of most severe to least severe, purposely, knowingly, recklessly, negligently. All right, and again, this will be written in the statute. You'll be able to read it and understand what it actually means. So, last class we ended here talking about. Harm, causation, and concerted standards. Remember, we talked about harm is required in some crimes, such as murder, but not all crimes. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to result in a harm. You don't have to prove a harm. All you have to prove in most crimes is the mens rea and the active rates, and in the, any attendant circumstances. Right? Causation is usually kind of inferred. You usually infer causation, but you do have to prove cause and fact and legal cause. When we talk about what cause and fact is, right? That's your parents having sex, having you, your grandparents having sex, having a parent, you know, anybody, anything attached to a crime to be a cause and fact. What we look for is legal causation. Legal causation is this notion of whether the crime was reasonably foreseeable, right? Whether your actions were reasonably foreseeable result in some kind of harm or some kind of crime. Okay. Was it reasonably foreseeable? And what we say to that is we say that we assume people act as reasonable human beings 24-7. We know this isn't true, but this is what we assume. Right? So with this, we say a reasonable person, or a reasonably prudent person, average intelligence, would see there's a causation between what you did and the harm that resulted, right? That it was reasonably foreseeable. Now, there's some cases we get into, um, pick my, if you study it, you'll eventually take a survey of American law, and we get into one example that it, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's a tort case, it's not a criminal case, but guy gets, the captain of a ship, um, comes in docks, right? And we're talking like a big boat. A storm is coming in. The captain of the ship is drunk. The captain of the ship is off the ship, doesn't tie it down. Knows there's a storm coming in, right? So storm comes in, his boat smashes into three or four other boats, and they go down river. They go down river to a drawbridge where the operator of the drawbridge is so drunk, he's asleep. So this big thing slams into the drawbridge, creates a dam, floods the valleys, floods the homes, you get like mud up to your neck, et cetera. And in that case, we break it down and say, all right, what was reasonably foreseeable here, right? Was it reasonably foreseeable that if you didn't tie down your ship, it would result in massive flooding that resulted in like mud up to your neck, 
that potentially kill people, et cetera, et cetera? Probably not. Like that, you wouldn't see that as a consequence. Was it reasonably foreseeable, though, that your boat, if you didn't pipe down and you knew there was a storm coming, would smash into the other boats? Absolutely, right? That's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about a reasonable person standard, saying, is it reasonably foreseeable? Then we have attendant circumstances. Attendant circumstances, again, you're not going to find them in every crime, but they'll be in some crimes. Basically, attendant circumstances are anything else that you have to prove by the statute. All right, so again, anything else required, and it usually enhances the severity of the crime. All right? So we think of a burglary. We'll get into some uh, crimes today, looking at the different elements. But if we think about burglary, generally speaking, burglary is breaking into an occupied dwelling to get a felony therein at night. So we have breaking and entering, is the act. To commit a felony therein, act mens rea as well. At night. At night is an attendant circumstance. Right? Because we have to prove everything in the statute, every word in the statute, line by line by line by line. So you get to the best DA in the world up there, you're on trial for burglary, and DA does not mention, doesn't even think to mention, that it was 9 p.m. when you committed the burglary. Judge is going to toss that case. But they didn't prove at night. Right? You have to prove everything in statute. So what we ultimately come up with um, is an equation, right? And we're going to be looking at the equation here in a minute. Um, but that being said, even if we meet the equation, right? So even if a prosecutor is able to prove actus reus, mens rea, causation, harm, attendant circumstances, etc. We're not done yet, right? Because we still have to visit definition of a criminal crime, the fifth element, which is for an act or mission to be criminal, the behavior must be committed without a defense or justification. So if you take my criminal law one class, we get into defenses and justifications, they're very different. Um, basically, defense is just a broad term that could mean any type of situation that could mitigate or excuse criminal behavior, right? So the most common defenses, insanity, right? We've all seen that or heard that. Um, we all think it's pled all the time. It's very, very, very rarely ever pled. Um, most people, I mean, nobody really pleads guilt by, or not guilty by insanity, um, partially because the outcome is not great. If you get found not guilty by reason of insanity, or mental, we call it mental disease or defect, um, you don't go home. You go to basically a prison hospital, right? So that's why it doesn't really get put that often. And the standard to prove it is crazy high, right? And we'll talk about that in take from law one. We'll talk about what, what the standards they are. You don't need to well, take mistake of fact. So mistake of fact is theoretically um, a defense. It's when you thought something existed, but it didn't exist. All right. So let's say that you're in line at Starbucks, and guy in front of you, wallet is hanging right out of his jeans. I mean, like just it's about to fall by itself. Right. So. You being the wonderful people that you are, you just take it. You're like, hey, woo, now I have two campus IDs and still no money. Awesome. So you take it. And you just kind of leave the line and go off. Person behind you comes up, who is a pickpocket, comes in and tries to pick the pocket into the person in front of him, the guy that you just stole the wallet from. He thinks this guy has a wallet. He doesn't. That's a mistake of fact. Now, in that scenario, that wouldn't get you off. I mean, you get attempt, you wouldn't get the actual crime itself, but you get attempt, um, which is attempted crimes, obviously less severe than fully committed crime. 
So let's take it back. So the second law is you thought the law was X when the law was Y, right? That would be you come in, you've lived in Pennsylvania your entire life, you come to New York, you're 18, you try to buy cigarettes. New York is 21. So what you can actually drive is like a misdemeanor. So you're charged with a misdemeanor. You can plead the second law. That being said, it's very, very rarely pled, very rarely successful because, remember what we talked about at the beginning of this class, is you're expected to know every law at all times. You're expected to abide by every law at all times. So mistake of law doesn't really go too far in terms of getting off the hook. Duress. Basically is, if you did commit the crime, something even worse is gonna happen, right? So this would be, um, you get a phone call and it says, the guy says, I have your family held hostage, right? I'm gonna kill them if you don't go rob that bank. And they'll, you know, don't tell the police, they'll come kill them. Well, you go rob the bank. Oh, that's bank robbery, that, that's a crime. But you can plead duress, right? Like, look, I didn't want to do it, but if I didn't do it, something worse was gonna happen, right? Didn't want to do it, but something worse is gonna happen. Consent. This is usually with personal crime, right? Crimes against people. Um, you cannot consent to your own murder, but you can consent to your own assault. Right? Think about professional football players or college football players, any football player. Aren't they just literally committing assault and battery for like 10 seconds and then second down? Like, yeah. But why do we allow it? Why don't we charge them all with crimes when they leave the field? Have they committed assault and battery? Absolutely. But they consented to it, right? They joined the team. They knew what was going to happen. That's consent. And so you can consent to your own battery. To have entrapment. Entrapment is when the police put the idea of committing the crime into your head. Like you would not commit the crime otherwise, and we have to prove you would not otherwise commit the crime. But the police put the idea into your head. All right, so this is you're sitting down and your family's dead, right? And let's say, uh, what world is it? Let's say you're well, okay, Mormon. Let's say you're Mormon. I don't know much about the religion, but let's say you're Mormon. Okay. You're sitting down at the family dinner table, and you go, gee golly, I'm excited for dinner, Dad. Oh, I can't wait, son. It's going to be delicious. Isn't it? your mother's terrific? Right? And so as you sit down to dinner, excited to be with the family, excited to hear about the day, you're a knock on the door. And father gets up and says, huh, I wonder who that could be. Well, let's go find out. I'll be back in a minute. Don't wait for me. So he goes off to the door. Trap on the other side of the door is crack dealer. He's a door to door crack dealer sale. Right? He goes door to door selling. And so he comes up to your door and he sells crack. It's like, hey, would you like some crack? Father goes, well, golly gee, that seems dangerous and wrong. And the crack says, no, absolutely not. In fact, it's better for your religion. The religion wants you to do it. And you know what the greatest thing about this crack is? This crack is going to bring your family together. Really? Well, that sounds terrific. And your father buys the crack. Turns out the crack dealer traveling door to door is an undercover cop. Your father gets arrested for buying crack. He was in track. Track was not in his head, he didn't want to do it, but the police kept pounding until he actually did it. Track and trap. Justification defenses? Basically, you're saying, yeah, I did it, but in the situation, it wasn't wrong. Right, so this would be like, you're out in the woods, you're stranded, 
it starts snowing. All right, the temperature is dropping precipitously. You're walking, you come across the town. Cabin's empty, cabin's vacant. But you know, if you stay outside, you're going to die. So you kick down the door, get inside, start a fire, get warm. Well, you've just committed burglary. And at the very least, breaking in. Might not have had a ticket of felony there, but at least breaking and entering. If you get arrested and charged with breaking and entering, we're going to say, well, under these circumstances, that what he did was justified, right? Like, we don't want greater harm to occur. This is our justification. <laughs> One that's become very interesting in terms of defense is medical necessity when it comes to marijuana. Right, so in states where it's not allowed recreationally, or even as a medicinal purpose, where, where it's still banned, but you have, and, and my mom had the cancer, and it was a horrible experience to see her go through it. Um, you, you have cancer, somebody you love has cancer. Cancer chemo basically just makes you vomit like entirely. Um, I mean, chemo destroys you. Like, it's literally one of the ingredients in most chemos is rat poison. Like, it is horrible. But one of the side effects is you vomit. One of the benefits of marijuana, now I'm not saying go do this, but one of the benefits of marijuana is stifles your gag reflex. You can't vomit. Also, it makes you hungry. Chemo makes you not hungry. Right? So people who go through chemo, my mother was a fairly large when she went through it. By the end of it, she was a rail. Right? It's just how it happens. So we want to increase eating and we want to stop the book. Bonding is it medically necessary, right? So we have seen some people get arrested, right? For buying marijuana or cancer. Now, this really hasn't gone to court that I know of, partially because every single newspaper or every single person who heard this story would be like, that's fucking bullshit, right? You're arresting somebody with cancer or marijuana? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, that's your gut reaction. Remember, most DAs, district attorneys, prosecutors, they're elected. They want to keep in good graces with the public. You don't want to be the dick who arrested the cancer patient for trying to not die. Right? So it's become kind of an interesting debate whether it's medically necessary. Um, obviously, states allow it, New York, New York allows it, it just doesn't have the necessary. Um, if it's medically necessary. So, that's kind of we get to kind of the equation of crime. Here's what this looks like, right? Remember, crime is a social construct, but if we want to prove under the criminal law, we have to have an actus reus plus mens rea. Generally, I mean, it depends. Harm plus causation plus attendant circumstances equals a crime, unless a defense or justification applies. Right, so we get through here, even if we get to here, the defense can still bring up a full defense. So the prosecutor is burdened with proving each one of these elements of a crime. That's proved each one beyond all reasonable doubt. We'll talk about what that means later on. All right, so they have to prove each one of these elements beyond all reasonable doubt. If they fail to prove even one of these elements, beyond all reasonable doubt, the case is dismissed. Right, the jury has to find the person not guilty. Now, let's say they prove all these elements beyond all reasonable doubt. Well, the defense gets a turn after they've proved them to cast doubt on them, to, to try to disprove them. They don't, they don't have any burden. Or they raise a defense or justification, right? If you raise a defense or justification, suddenly you as the defendant now have a burden of proof. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt, but you had to prove that you were entrapped, there was duress, whatever, by a preponderance of the evidence. All right, so basically, beyond a reasonable doubt, if you think of a scale of spectrum from zero to 100, at 95% is beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? 
Um, so again, 95% beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and the thought process behind this is, is you can never be fully certain, right? Because theoretically, let's say that you get hot robbing group, right? So you, you know, here's the is it possible that you were actually at home asleep, but aliens came down, cloned your DNA, cloned your body, took your body shape, your fingerprints, your DNA, et cetera, went and robbed the grocery store, and then got back into their spaceship and left? Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible, and it's pretty possible. But is that reasonable? Like, is it doubt? It's absolute doubt. But is it reasonable? So what we know? No, not reasonable. Like that shit insane. Like, no. So that's what we're talking about. Um, beyond reasonable doubt. That's why we put it at 95%. Right? So So if we go on a, on a scale of proof, right, the prosecutor's down here, having to prove everything by 95% basically. If you raise an excuse and justification, you only have to prove it by 50.01%, if you want to, however you want to. Right? So just over 50%. Is so it more likely than not that this will right? so That's our question for crime. That being said, let's jump into some crimes, see what they look like. How they actually unfold, what the elements are, etc. So that just us to modern criminal law. So this is just a review of I would say what we just talked about. All right, crimes consist of the elements, plus there's a principle of justification, and here they are. Now, before we jump into like the actual wording of statutes, we have to understand one fairly. Big thing. Uh, who's ever seen that the um, movie Legally Blonde? Like, yeah, you've seen it, right? There's a scene in Legally Blonde where the professor, who turns out to be like a little fucking creep, um, asks, Would you rather have a client who's committed a crime, malum in se, or malum prohibitum? And then, like, the bitch answers, like, uh, malum prohibitum. Right? Because it's created basically a regulatory infraction instead of a serious crime of felony. And then I was like, um, I think the other one, I think no one needs to I think decided that could challenge. And like, it's like a bitch to that. So, what the hell are they talking about? Well, crimes used to be categorized in two ways historically, under the, 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 the philosophically, and kind of under the common law. So we had Malum in say, Offenses and malum prohibitum offenses. Malum and say offenses are actions that are inherently wrong. Right, something that's wrong in and of itself because it is. Right, so anything that reflects moral turpitude. Right, so we're talking about the serious felony. Right, we're talking murder, rape, robbery whatever else, right? So the thing that is morally wrong, we kind of discussed this when we talked about like, is there any natural law, right? Any governing law? No, but we kind of as society said, all right, these are our beliefs, these are our expectations. If you violate something that is basic morality, you've committed a malignant say offense. However, if you commit an offense that's not morally wrong, Necessarily, or derives from the morals of society, you commit an offense of malum prohibita. Right, so malum prohibita is, is basically anything that's wrong because of a statute. Right, a statute is just wrong. Right, so think of oh, okay. Did anybody drive a car today? 
Okay. At any point, did you know this little model of the sequence? You've been an offensive algorithm. Right? Because it's not, we don't have a moral obligation. We're not like, well, morally, it's 55. Right? No. It's not just not like, like, no. There's no morals that tell us what the speed limit is. We don't agree as yes, society, morality speaking, like, what would Jesus draw? Like, we don't do that. Right? We just set a speed limit, say you have to follow it. You don't follow it. You haven't broken the morals of society. You just broke something that's wrong with the statute. Obviously, mal and saber offenses are much more severe than mal prohibitive offenses. Although they can be both, right? A mal and say offense will probably encompass a mal prohibitive. Right? So if you commit murder, you've done something that's morally wrong, and it's wrong because of statute. Right? Um, so that's kind of our old classification. Today, we break this, we basically just made the Latin go away and kind of kept the same idea. We have felonies and we have misdemeanors. All right? So, what's the difference between the two? With a felony, you have the possibility, it doesn't mean you will get it, but your crime carries the possibility that you will get one year or more in prison. Prison and jail is different. Prison is what we have up here on the hill, right? A Myra Correctional Facility with the two naked guys doing inappropriate stuff. Seriously, if you haven't seen it, there's a statue of two naked guys in front of the prison, like looking like they're sodomizing each other in front of the prison. Welcome to Elmira. So, you have Elmira Correctional Facility. That is prison. You're in Shimon County right now. There's a Shimon County Jail. All right, so if you commit a felony, you're gonna get, you have the possibility, not me you're going to, but you have the possibility of getting a year or more in prison, right, up on the hill. If you commit a misdemeanor, misdemeanors are less serious, very, very less serious. It's punishable by less, less than one year in jail, right? So 364 days in the Shimon County Jail. That's a misdemeanor. Right? We also impose dollar amounts. So if you can get a fine, right? You're not going to go to jail, but you can get a fine. You get a fine of, can get a fine of more than one thousand dollars. It's a felony. If you your fine is less than one thousand dollars, it'd be classified as a misdemeanor, right? So, I mean, think about things like uh, your. Uh, I was riding the train into Boston every day. There was like, there was a handbrake, like an emergency brake, but right next to it, it said, you know, if you pull this and it's not an emergency, you can be fined up to one thousand dollars and spend up to a year in jail. And I was always really tempted. Because that's a misdemeanor. Like they try to word it in such a way, but like I said, not more than a, a, a fine up to $1,000 and, and or a sentence of up to one year in jail. Nobody goes away for their first felt or their first misdemeanor. Like we give you a couple chances. So I was always wanting to be like, you see like the train come to a screeching halt. Um, like when you're at a train for an hour, it's just it's every day, one way or two way. Um, so that's kind of our general note, right? And felonies and misdemeanors. Felonies are the really serious shit. Misdemeanors are the less serious shit. That being said, some states have created a third category. Violation. Right, so felony, misdemeanor, violation. Violations are less serious than misdemeanors. Again, misdemeanors, they can, they can range, right? They can range from possession of marijuana, which is a very low level misdemeanor, like if it's within a certain amount, right? All the way up to different attempts that like lower level felonies. Um, so we have a broad range there. 
Some states have created violations. These violations are less serious than the most, they're less serious than the least serious misdemeanors. Right? And the idea about a violation, it's not technically a crime. Right? So if you get caught in doing a violation, usually, not all the time, but most states that have violations will say it's a civil infraction. Right? So it's not a crime. You didn't commit a crime. You can always check no on the box. I didn't commit a crime. But it's a civil infraction. It's like a speeding ticket, right? You get a speeding ticket, cop pulls you over, it's a police officer. You think you committed a crime, you're speeding. Technically, you haven't committed a crime. You've committed a civil infraction, right? Depending on how fast you're going. Like, if you're going 20 over, then yeah, you're getting tough. But like, beyond you know, that, no. Um, it's a civil infraction, right? That's why most people just sign the ticket, Put the check in, send it off. Right? It, it's a civil infraction. It doesn't have any bearing on your criminal record. It does have a bearing on your insurance, just FYI. Um, like your insurance rates will double. Mine about to go up. I got into an accident a few days or a couple weeks ago. Well, I paid too much as it is. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like where we're at, right? So, if we think about violations, some examples that we've seen other states do is one that's very broad, and I argue unconstitutionally broad, disorderly conduct. All right, so disorderly conduct is you're not acting like a reasonable person in public, right? You're going around like talking to people, like just doing stupid shit. Like just, you're being annoying, right? Like you're being an annoying human being. That's what disorderly conduct basically is. is you're an annoying human being, you need to stop. So we're going to charge you with a violation, right? So you're, you're going to pay a fine. Just stop, right? Usually that'll go hand in hand with public intoxication, things like loitering. Um, again, loitering is an iffy issue because theoretically it's part of the vagrancy laws, right? So vagrancy laws, they were constitutionally challenged and, and was an interesting result. Basically, you can't punish somebody for being homeless, right? But you can punish somebody for loitering, right? So, like staying on a bench in front of a business, or like you know, in the stoop of a business, and loitering. Does that really get charged that often? Yeah. Again, if you go to Boston at night, every door in the winter, every door stick is going to have people on it, and there's going to be people sleeping down down in the subway where it's unbelievably hot, right? Just to stay warm. So they don't really do anything. It's like it's at night and during the day they just disappear. Nobody's there, so not a big deal. But theoretically, loitering. I mean, loitering. We mostly go after like teenagers for doing loitering, right? Like they're all hanging out in the parking lot. That's loitering, right? You don't have any awful business there. You're just loitering. Public intoxication. Some states it's a misdemeanor. Other states it's a violation. Um. Again, this usually goes hand in hand with disorderly conduct because if you went to college and you learned how to hold your liquor, which I'm sure some of you are starting to do, <laughs> being drunk in public and nobody knows it, not a big deal. Like if you're driving, you should know, but like if you're just drunk and like you go out for a walk, and you're shit faced, but you're walking, that's fine. Like when you feel like you're involved, you're fine. You're not bothering anybody, just be at least aren't going to care. Like, whatever, you're not doing anything, you're not getting the car to drive, right? Nope. All right, go about your business. But if you're drunk and you're like, go up to you, I, I love you. I want the best, fuck you. Like, in that case, like, yeah, not only are you, we're going to charge you with being intoxicated in the public, or also in charge you with disorderly conduct because you're being an annoying fucking human being. All right? So that is where we're at. Um, just things to keep in the back of your mind you know, as weekends approach and whatnot. That being said, there are some situational factors that make things difficult. So, for instance, two, one, two that I'll mention hate crimes, domestic violence. All right? So, um, 
I had a, had a case where um, it was, it, okay, so usually just simple battery, like you just go up and punch somebody, it's going to use it. It's, it's an issue, right? Um, it's not that big of a deal. If it's a hate crime, if you do it, if you punch somebody or get into a fight, out of hate, right? When we say hate, it's defined under a statute. I mean, race, color, creed, gender orientation, what have you, right? So I have this case where this guy was, he's getting gas at the gas station at night, right? He's getting gas. Another car pulls up and guy gets out, some section. Right? Um, and we know this because he comes over and he starts like, he starts talking to my client, but like trying to hit on my client, and then kind of starts getting sexually aggressive. Right, so like, he was, I don't know, but like he was getting sexually aggressive. And so, yeah, like, just get out of here, get out of here. Um, the guy goes into the store, comes back out, client still he had with the big ass car. Like he's still pumping his gas. And the guy comes up to him and like rubs against his crotch. He just falls ass and punches him in the face. Normally, that's gonna be a misdemeanor. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts charged it as a felony. Because, I mean, excuse me, I don't believe this, I don't know what to say. But because after he punched him, got on the ground, he got into his truck. As he was leaving, he turned and yelled the word faggot. So they charged him with a felon, a very serious felon. Right? So, like, I had to, like, try and defend that. Um, was like, no, that wasn't a hate crime. Like, he was pissed. Maybe he had hate afterwards, but in the moment, and we would think bottles, like, not great. So we can jump things up, right? Hate crimes are actually very, very, they've always been kind of disputed um, or, or confrontational or, or, or a source of conflict. Partially because it's, the, the, the argument that I see it, as people say, is who gives a shit what you were thinking or what your motives were, you did what you did, right? So are we just punching somebody for thoughts or, or you know, saying words or, or something like that? Um, but then on the other hand, you have like people who target other people because of color, very religion, whatever. So I mean, you can have this, this weird kind of argument in the law back and forth. But we, most states still have different hate crimes and hate crime legislation is always kind of evolving. Domestic violence is another one that's evolving. Um, go to Connecticut, if you are engaged in Domestic violence, police by law have to arrest both parties. So even if you are the victim, you're going to get handcuffed, charged with domestic violence. I actually have a, a friend that, that her boyfriend was, when the police saw, when the police came, her boyfriend at the time had her against the wall, strangling her. She like, was like heaving on his chest. I mean, he had her off the ground strength. They come in, gun strong, and put her down. Puts her down. She gets handcuffed first. Then they handcuff her. Right? Because under Connecticut law, if it's domestic violence, both parties get arrested. She ultimately pled down, but there's a mark on her record saying domestic violence, even though she was clearly the victim. So that's where domestic violence is kind of a weird situation. Um, it's the call that police don't like to respond to the most because that's where the violence is. And we're actually going to look at something when we talk about policing. We're going to see actually policing isn't necessarily as dangerous as we think it is, like we perceive it from TV. Um, I'll show you the 10 most dangerous jobs. You can kind of get it from there. But this is the one that police don't like to go to because they know there's going to be violence. They know it's going to be like this is where like police can get shot, right? This is where they, this is where they're scared the most. Like of like, this is where I can get hurt. 
And they're also scared for the victims too. It's like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna find. Like, is, is, is he killing her? Do I shoot her? Like, what do I do? So we kind of changed threats and violence. It used to be just a usually like a misdemeanor. Like you just as long as there was like low key violence, you get a misdemeanor. But that's not okay. Right? Like it's, it's just not okay. Like intimate partner violence is the one talking about domestic violence. It's kind of like the, the further iteration of it, right? You don't have to live together. The best relationship. Usually, it has gone higher. Um, white collar crime has actually usually gone down in terms of severity, but domestic violence is it's become a huge challenge. Right? We have family courts. There's actually some specialized family courts that just deal with domestic violence cases. Um, it's very pervasive, right? And if you're in that situation, reach out. And that situation never gets better. Like in the history of domestic violence, it's never gotten better. The guy or the girl or whomever has never changed. All right? They weren't just mad. Domestic violence ends in two ways. Always, two ways. First is an arrest. And that allows the person to escape. And the rest are going to escape. The second and most common ending is death, murder. Right? So, like, a slap in the face now could be a murder three years from now. And right? so, get out of that situation. Reach out to somebody. There are a lot of people you can reach out to. I mean, come talk to me, we'll help you. Um, so yeah, that's just my little plug for like, stuff So, if we want to take a look at types of crime. So looking at specific crimes, let's look at the crime of murder. Right? First, I want to clarify a definitional aspect. Murder and homicide are two different things. Same result, but two different things. Homicide is when we're referring to a killing of another human being by another human being. That's a homicide. It becomes murder when we add the mens rea at the end. Right? Like, yes, you killed somebody, it's a homicide, um, or manslaughter, we'll call it manslaughter. Um, but I mean, it's, a ham it's not murder, you didn't have a bad, bad heart. So, that being said, if we take homicide, killing of another human being by another human being, common law, it's divided into two categories, right? So, the first is murder, which is where you have the evil, evil intent. Common law required something that you might have seen or heard on TV before called malice of forethought. Malice of forethought. What that means is premeditation. You plan the murder. And that's your malice of forethought. You plan the murder. Plan the murder. That's the old common law used to require. We don't require premeditation anymore necessarily to be a murder. Because we have different degrees of murder. But as we're going to see, it's attendant circumstances, usually when we're talking like first degree murder. Now, manslaughter, on the other hand, is basically the definition of everything that does not require malice of forethought. Right? So you didn't plan it, you didn't plan it for somebody to die, and they didn't. Right? That's what we're talking in manslaughter. Manslaughter is still very serious. It gets kind of this weird connotation that it's not that big of a deal. But you're still looking at like 25 years in prison, depending on the degree. Um, and the situation. Like if it was like one that's like legitimately like nobody could foresee it as an accident, you're gonna get like man's food or reckless endangerment, something different. So that being said, if we look at the statute, right? Statute is the law, written down law by the legislature. Under the modern statutory scheme, the elements, right, these things that have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt of murder are one, the actus reus, the voluntary killing of another person, two, mens rea, purposefully or knowingly, or I'm going to throw a fifth mental state in for you, extremely recklessly. Right, so extremely recklessly is like, it's like the, the middle ground between 
recklessly and knowingly. Like, yeah, it's just a weird note. But all these kind of imply sometimes with intent. Remember, purposely, it's your goal to commit the crime, it's goal to let that person die. Knowingly, you're all but certain that the person will die because of your actions. Extremely recklessly, you weren't all but certain, but you're very close. Right. And then we go down to recklessly negative. Then we have to prove an aggravating circumstance if we want to prove first degree murder. Right, so murder is broken down usually in two degrees, first degree, second degree. And then we have manslaughter one, manslaughter two. Um, manslaughter, mur murder in the first degree is required, if you're not speaking, in order to get the death penalty. Right? Here in New York, New York doesn't have the death penalty. Pennsylvania does. It's been suspended by the governor, but that could change with the election, right? So just be careful when you kill somebody. Um, and don't cross state lines when you do it, because it's a federal offense. So if we want to prove first degree murder, we have to prove an attendant circumstance. Ten circumstances is generally when we're going to talk about premeditation, right? That's usually what we want to talk about first degree murder. Like, you planned on killing this person. Now, we get into this in criminal law one, but premeditation isn't like, you don't have to think about it for that long. Premeditation, for most, for many jurisdictions, most courts of laws, lasts. That's enough for premeditation. If that goes in your mind, kill with a knife. That's premeditation. Right? So, that's, again, that's depending on the state and the, and the law. But that's usually we're talking deliberation, meditation. Also, possible is something, and these are just examples. Like, there's a very long list, and we got through the law of like what constitutes murder one cruel, cruel and unusual, like cruelty, unusual cruelty. Um, this is something like you didn't shoot somebody. But you maybe cut their head off while they were alive. And you didn't premeditate it, but you did it. That's cruel, or that's unusually cruel. Kid got shot and stabbed every day. Having your head like cut off with like a hacksaw, not so much. That's cruel. I mean, that's, I mean the, the person is suffering, that's pain, we don't want. So, as I was saying earlier, we base our degrees of murder uh, based on mental status in the state. All right, so first degree murder, generally speaking, encompasses two sub components. All right, so we have the premeditated murders with the intent to kill, right? The, the ones that we're discussing. Um, or they might have other factors such as unusual cruelty. Okay? The second are felony murders. Again, first degree includes felony murder, right? What is felony murder? Basically, felony murder, um, I think virtually every state has it, says if you commit a felony, during the course of committing the felony, anyone dies, you can be charged with first degree murder, even if it's like a very low level felony, right? Even if it's like burglary. Somebody dies, you can be charged with murder. Now this becomes an interesting case when you have like a group of people, like posse, all right? Break to his house, you steal their TV. You committed a felony. On the way out, you're not approaching the, the, the counselor, but on the way out, you're still in the house. The owner of the house comes down with a gun, shoots and kills one of your friends in the posse. The rest of the posse leaves. Okay? Under the castle doctrine, let's say it's the castle doctrine state, he's perfectly justified what he did. You get caught later. We don't just charge you with burglary, we also charge you with first degree murder. Even though you didn't kill anybody, it was somebody else, right? There was a whole other group, like, no, you get charged with first degree murder. And the idea behind this is we know you're going to commit felonies. Right, so most people commit between one and three felonies and a slew of misdemeanors in their life. Like virtually everyone commits one to three felonies. Most people won't get caught. So what we say is, look, we know you're gonna commit felonies, but if you're gonna commit a felony, you have to do it in the safest way possible. That's 
I don't know. But that's the thought process behind felony murder. All right? If you're committing a felony, which is a serious offense, do it in the safest way possible. Because at the end of the day, like we can repair broken things, we can refund money, we can all that stuff. But you can't bring someone back to one. And that's the thought process behind it. Like, hey, you're gonna commit this felony, make sure that nobody gets hurt. And then again, first degree murder, if it's a death penalty state, it's death penalty eligible. Second degree murder is not death penalty eligible. And it consists of intentional murders. So you intended, right, right? It was your purpose or knowingly, that's intent, right? Purposely or knowingly. Either purpose or you, or, or you knowingly committed a murder that was not premeditated or deliberate, was not a felony murder, was not a serious bodily injury murder, so again, like instant head off, or depraved heart murder, so again, family set head off, right? Like, if it wasn't, basically, if it's not first degree murder, it's gonna jump down to second degree. Right, so if it doesn't have a qualification for first degree, then down, down to second degree. If we get rid of the intentional part, then we see it jump down to the manslaughters. So, that being said, let's look at manslaughter. All right, this is voluntary manslaughter. So voluntary manslaughter, again, so this is like, yeah, first degree murder, most serious, second degree murder, second most serious, manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, also called manslaughter one, third most serious. This is suddenly and intentionally killing another person in the heat of anger under adequate provocation. All right, so I'll say that again. Suddenly and intentionally, right, purposely or knowingly, extremely or purposely, killing another person in the heat of anger following adequate provocation. All right, so you can see we're going with this one, right? This is the you come home, you find your truly beloved. You're forever after. You're sorry. In bed with somebody else. Go to the night stand, grab the gun, shoot some of them both, put the finger at the Right? Um, probably gonna get charged with one three manslaughter. It depends on how you do it. Like, these are gonna get charged with one three manslaughter. So we looked at the actus reus, right? The actus required for every single crime. We have a voluntary act of killing another person. With the intent to kill or intent to inflict serious bodily injury. The intended circumstances, these are the important ones for this one, right? Killing, sudden heat of passion. So you find your truly beloved and that is somebody else, that's gonna invoke some passion. If it doesn't, you probably shouldn't have been in that relationship anyway. But you know, that's your deal, not mine. That's what you're like. Right? So heat of passion, right? We have the, 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 the prosecution has to prove heat of passion. So, he is passionate. And adequate provocation. All right? So, he is passionate. That's usually like he didn't think it through, he just did it. When we get to adequate provocation, right? Adequate provocation is kind of like it, it's a reasonable person standard of would that be enough to make you kill two people? kill a person? I mean, really, is that reasonable? Like, is that a reasonable reaction? If it's not a reasonable reaction, we're jumping up to murder two, maybe murder one. Right? But if it's a reasonable reaction, not equal provocation, we've proved the, the, the required intent circumstances for voluntary manslaughter. So think about something like you come home from from work, you find your love, your truly beloved, your soulmate, your dearest, your diamond, the artist, you love, whatever. Right? All that bullshit. Yes, I'm angry, love does not exist. So, it really doesn't. So, you can tell I'm divorced, right? Um, so, let's say you come home and the human being that you call your spouse has just finished population, 
with the third person. Third person took a shower, got dressed, and they're sitting there talking. You come in, you know what happens. You see like a condom on the, the bed, you know what happens. You lose your mind, you be a passion, like you go to the nice stand, you grab the gun, and you shoot and kill them both. Is that adequate conversation? They both have a shower, take it, have the clothes on, they're just sitting there talking. Is that enough to send you into a rage? Because that's what we're asking here. Is it enough to send you into a rage? And it's very situational, very certain, like very circumstantial, based on circumstances. Also, yeah, if you see two, your two people having sex, that could be a huge trick. But they're sitting there, but you know they had sex, but they're just sitting there talking. Is that enough to send you into a reasonable person into a rage? Um, this becomes this becomes really interesting. Uh, the heat of passion when we talk about people with gun safes. I always love this one. Like, there's actually a patient reading from all one. Guy comes home from his wife's bed and he's angry. Right? He said he blacks out, wakes up. They're both shocked. Okay. Maybe that happened. I mean, they probably did. But he readily admits he was not armed. He does say there are guns in the house, but they're in the gun safe. The gun safe has a combination lock. Right? And so we're talking about adequate provocation. Just means you, it means you don't have time to cool down. Right? Like there's no time to cool down. You're just rage, bam, bam. For him, finding his bed and why he was there, he had to go downstairs in this rage. Remember the combination to the combination safe. Enter a combination to the combination safe. I don't know about you or me. Like, I can never figure that shit out in high school. Like, every day as I would just show up to the gym, like, put jeans on. I'm like, I'm not going to fuck. Like, let's just do this. Right? So he has to remember that, hit the gun, miss the guns are unloaded, and to load the gun, has to go back upstairs, shoot, kill them up. Was that enough to send him into a rage? Yeah, probably. Was it adequate provocation? Do you have time to cool down? That's up to the jury. I'll tell you this when we get into talking about juries. Juries are the dumbest people on the face of the planet. We tried to choose their juries who are stupid. We do. It's so the fact that you took no this class and you to a major or third major, you'll get called for jury duty at some point, but you will be excused from it very quickly. Right, like my juries, I didn't want smart people on my jury. So that's not all, though. All right, For those of you packing up, you still got like two minutes. Calm the fuck down. Three, you have to have an honest but not reasonable belief that you are killing in self-defense. Right, so this is an and. Once you are and, or you have an honest but not reasonable belief you're killing in self-defense. This happens when you have somebody maybe with mental health issues, right? And they think that if, if they don't kill the guy in the ice cream truck who is an alien, who has probed him, that he is going to die. We're going to say, okay, you legitimately believe that, but it, I still have a minute, was not adequate, right? The way it wasn't reasonable. And then causation, the provocation, caused the killing. All right, so this class will begin from where we're at now, jumping ahead, so read for the next class, can't stay on track, and we'll go from there. Thank you.